Okay, uh, welcome all to the online <laughs> seminar. So today we're very happy to have uh, Dimitri Chilpak from the Ecole Normale Superior and the St. Petersburg Department there. Uh, and uh, and uh, I will, uh, I've put a link to the uh, slides of the talk on the Horvitz Seminar website. I see the link in the chat now and you're welcome also to look here. So thank you very much, Jim, Dima, please. Start. Okay, thanks Ron and Asaf uh, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be at Tel Aviv, even in this mood. I mean, uh, yeah. anyway, yeah, it would be nicer to be in person, but uh, even such an opportunity is a great thing. Uh, sure, so welcome when possible to come, Dima. It would be great. Yeah, but, but by the way, I do see the chat, so if you have any question, you can just ask it there, or and uh, I really invite you to ask questions. And anyone can unmute themselves and just ask by voice if needed. You can interrupt the talk. Okay, yeah. So what I'm going to, to speak about is here, the, the title, do you see my screen? Is it still there? Okay. Yes, Great. we see your Great. Uh, so the title is here and uh, you can notice that there are like three different things. I mean, like bipartite dimer model, this is basically probability or uh, discrete probability or statistical physics, something like that. Gaussian free field, which is a central object to many, many things, and that's uh, two-dimensional in my talk, an analog of the Brownian motion. But then there is a third object, which is quite weird in this context, which is Lorentz minimal surfaces. And uh, the, basically the uh, most important idea uh, of this talk is to say that the bipartite dimer model turns out to be related to the Lorentz geometry, which is the kind of a non expected thing, at least for us. So, that's a joint reason. I mean, that's recent works with Binal Alie, who is in Paris, Sanjay, who is also in Paris, and Mariana, who is in MIT now. Sanjay and Mariana are in the room, I believe. So, okay, you can ask them to some details. Uh, Okay, right. So that's uh, the outline. Uh, what I want to emphasize from the very beginning is that it's going to be a theorem on this slide. So right now this is really an outline, but it's going to be a theorem. And then there is an illustration. So this, this is actually ILL. So this is illustration. Uh, right, because in the theorem it will be a kind of a weird assumption. And this weird assumption will be that actually Lorentz minimal surfaces, the, okay, we assume that they appear in some context. And here is a very classical example, I mean, bipartite dimer model on some concrete graphs in which we can see that this assumption is not like, you know, something taken, I don't know, from, from I mean, some weird thing taken for, for an unclear reason, uh, but this, that this effect uh, actually happens, okay? Uh, so, just the plan of the talk. I'm going to start with, uh, with what are the height functions, what is known. What I want to highlight uh, right now is that behind the theorem, there is a long-term motivation. And the long-term motivation is actually to analyze the bipartite dimer model on random graphs. So what is the link between the left and the right here is that on the right, the graphs on which the model lives, they're very regular. They basically a subset. Okay, in this example is a subset of the square grid. And morally, all the known results on the dimer model you know, the convergence of fluctuations in the dimer model, they deal with uh, uh, subgraphs of a fixed grid. And there is an intrinsic reason, the war is an intrinsic reason for that. And for this motivation, okay, there is no local structure in random maps. So the whole story started with the idea that, okay, but how should we, should we view, how should we analyze the dimer model on the regular graphs? And this question can be thought somehow as being parallel to question, okay, given a graph, how would you analyze harmonic functions on this, uh, on this graph? 
And one of the possible ways to do this, say, how would you study limit theorems or so? And one of the possible ways to do this is to embed this graph properly. Okay, so that's what is known under the name either Tats embedding or Barrett centric embeddings. And now there is a tool which is to a great extent similar, but in the context of the Daimler model. And in particular, it is more general than Tats embeddings. Okay, so that's the, the, the idea is that, okay, okay, we are going to draw such graphs, for instance, in a very special way. Okay, the main result. Okay, somewhere here, that's perfect embeddings main theorem, uh, but that's I'm going to comment on on the way. Okay, so that's the plan, and the composition of the talk, the overall composition, is a bit non-standard, because this is a slide with the main theorem, which I'm not assuming that people in the room are able to understand right now. So this is something to, to where I uh, uh, will be returning over and over again. So that's the main theorem. Okay, let me start. The, the, the overall idea is just to understand all the notions in this theorem. So I believe that's a reasonable goal for this talk. By the way, how much time exactly do I have? One hour or 50 minutes? Or? The, the talk is one hour. One hour, okay, super. Uh, okay, so let me start uh, with emphasizing one again, uh, that this is the illustration this illustration and this is an example of a very concrete finite weighted bipartite tenor graphs okay so this is a concrete example there are no one under the name uh aztec diamonds and what is that well i believe i I mean, it's clear from the picture. I shouldn't give any formal definition. So this is a subgraph of Z2 where you can vary the size of the diagonal. Okay, typically you should, I mean, when you think about the limit, you, you should view this as a parameter which tends to infinity instead of this delta which tends to zero. And on this picture, on this illustration, on this postcard, if you wish, uh, this object, is just the adds the graph of a very big size. Okay, that's what this illustration is. Now, as I already mentioned, these graphs, they are going to be embedded into the complex plane in some specific way, which I'm going to comment on. So, those are embeddings. Okay, those perfect embeddings. So, and the embedding on that picture is here. And the colors, they don't mean much. They just illustrate, I mean, which regions of, of this graph come to, to, to which regions here. They just view this as a, I mean, colors are just to, to illustrate how this map works at this moment, okay? In particular, all the regions near the corners, they're collapsed to very small points, uh, to very tiny areas, sorry, to, to tiny areas, regions near the corners. And this vicinity of the circle, okay, it is stretched a bit, and it goes to the, to, to the vicinity of the, of the boundary of the square, okay? So, this is the embed. And of course, the game is to understand how, how all that works. Uh, now, okay, the most non-probabilistic object, I mean, something, uh, something apparently oops, uh, not related to, to the probability is, dot, is those Lorentz minimal surfaces. And this is something that I'm going to comment on right now. Okay, so in this example, my domain dxi is just the square and over the square, there is a graph of a surface. So this is supposed to be a surface. And uh, to give more details, okay, technology. Uh, well, this is a white word. So how does this work? Uh, this is just the hyperboloid, right? Uh, a unisphere in the, in the Minkowski space, if you wish. 
Okay. Now this hyperboloid is a doubly rolled surface. So given a point, there are two lines passing through that. And what you can do, you can do such a drawing. So this boundary contour is actually here. Okay. So this is effectively the Aztec surface. Let me call it like that. Uh, sorry, Dima, you, you took on the hyperboloid and you, uh, you drew the straight lines on the hyperboloids between them, right? Is that what I'm seeing? Right, that's what you're seeing, exactly. And uh, maybe, maybe an option is just to say, okay, what happens if you project this onto the horizontal plane. And when you project it onto the horizontal plane, what you see is just a circle. It's a projection of the of the whole of the hyperboloid. And then there is a square which is tangent to the circle. So the minimal surface is on the hyperboloid and the boundary are the lines. So it has to fit in the lines and it minimizes yeah. Right. So, so what I explained is that there is this contour, this quadrilateral, which is a not planar, non-planar quadrilateral, uh, which lies on the hyperboloid. And then what the word minimal means is that now I just I'm looking for for a surface which, okay, in this case, maximizes the area. But that's that's the matter of science. Okay. So this is a solution to the plateau problem, but in the Lorentzian method. So what I want to say is that <coughs> this surface is what is called in physics space-like. It means that the gradient is less than one everywhere. Uh, and because of that, uh, you can view it as, a, as a, just a normal Riemann surface. If you induce the metric onto the surface, this is a positive Riemann metric. In particular, the surface it carries some some uh, it carries a structure of of a complex manifold, if you wish. Okay. So in this concrete example, okay, here is the surface. So this is my domain. What is called uh, in my slides dx sign. This surface is called s sign. And then, okay, I'll, uh, uh, I'm going to comment on what the Gaussian tree field is, uh, but basically that's a random distribution which is defined uh, on whatever on whatever simply connected, say domain or simply connected. Okay, okay, simply connected domain. So the only thing you need to know is the complex structure. And what I what the theorem claims is that okay, some object in the Daimler model, after we draw graphs properly converges to the Gaussian free field in the metric, oh, la, la, all right, in the, the, in the metric of this surface. So that's the, okay, the plan, I mean, the, the plan, what we are interested in. We are interested to draw graphs, given graphs properly. So that to see that fluctuations, they converge to the JFF in a metric, okay, in some metric. And the very un unexpected, at least for our thing, is that the Lorentzian geometry comes into play in, in some special way. Any questions so far? Okay, right now it's just a fairy tale, right? So uh, by uh, Lorentzian geometry, is it always uh, that the hyper hyperboloid is uh, meant? This uh, yeah. No, no, what, no, no, no. What, what I what I mean, okay, it's, it's hyperboloid too. But what I mean is that this minimality should be thought of as a solution to as just like soap uh, forms, right? But not in the Euclidean metric, and rather in the Lorentzian metric. What did you say were boundary conditions for that, or you want to say that later? Uh, that, that's I'm going to say later. I mean, what exactly right. we assume? I mean, right right now, that's just a general, I mean, general structure of the theorem. And as I said, the main goal is just to explain the theorem, just to explain all the notions. Well, I will comment on proofs, but not not that. 
that, that much. Yeah, you're welcome. Shitsky, Gura Bray, and, and I guess Lalit. Right. right. Uh, also yeah, I, 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 I will comment. I will comment on this uh, later. But the point is that the result is not about the Dimer model, right? The result is about uniform spinning trees. And in general, in general, there is no bijection between Dimers and uniform spinning trees. That, that, that's the point. Uh, but I barely hear you, by the way. So th there is something with your microphone. So, and in general, uh, well, this was a particular example. So, and here there are this dx i s x i. So, general picture is that okay? Instead of instead of the square, what we assume is that the embedding converges to a curve okay, to, to this area. And uh, then when you lift it back uh, to here, the hyperboloid, uh, well, there is now a curve lifted to this hyperboloid. Uh, in this example, something like that. Then you solve the plateau problem here and, okay, everything is the same. Okay, but as I said, for the theorem, it's going to be an assumption. This setup is going to be an assumption, right? If I just stated the theorem as it is, a very logical question would be, what's the heck? Why at all should we assume this? And this postcard with the ad stack, and I just referred to the paper, that's a very short paper, that, and the main purpose is just to give an illustration. It shows that this notion is relevant. So that, that's, that's it. Okay, so here on this picture, um, just the notation, uh, but it's not of, of that big importance. And so in this picture, this is I, um, I work assign. So. Which is right, and then you pick it. Okay, uh, so okay, hopefully, we understand now what this Lorentz minimal surfaces are, just in continuum without any link with the Daimler model. Uh, what, is the comp what is the complex structure there? Okay, and now, okay, remember that slide. And now I move to just to, to the real introduction. What is the bipartite dimer model and so on and so forth. So what is the bipartite dimer model? You just take uh, whatever weighted bipartite graph and you look at perfect matchings, which means just collection of edges which covers every vertex once. And then dimer configuration is just another name for such perfect matching, and the probability is the product of the widths. Okay. Also, in this picture, note that I oriented, my graph is bipartite, I oriented all the dimers from black to white, okay, for some laser purposes. And here is a very particular example. So this is what is called Tangerland domains on Z2. And here there is a very concrete combinatorial condition on how the boundary is drawn. And the condition is that all the corners of this domain, they're just black uh, vertices, where black now means one out of four colors, not one of out of two. So this black, they're split between, uh, I mean, the color black and gray. Okay. So this is an example of Temperland domains with one corner removed. And why these domains are nice is that there you can play what is called the temporary bijection. So here is an illustration. I believe that a good portion of uh, people in the room, uh, you already saw, I mean, this bijection, so you know this by heart, but anyway, it's intuitively clear from the picture what you do. So given a blue dimer uh, configuration, uh, you can construct a spanning tree on these black vertices and vice versa. Okay. That's how the correspondence works. 
And somehow this gives you the idea that, uh, okay, a random box is a relevant object in this case, because uniform spanning trees, each branch of the of a uniform spanning tree is, uh, as we know from Wilson's algorithm, is a trajectory, is the trajectory of a loop rest random walk. And because of that, so what I want uh, to emphasize is that discrete harmonic functions uh, they naturally appear, and moreover, they naturally appear with nice boundary conditions. Okay, that's important. And this nice, nice boundary conditions. Okay, it's very important in this business, and here it is just directly boundary conditions because random walks they they just are absorbed in the boundary. Okay. So this is a very on the left. This is a very general definition. On the right, this is another concrete example. Coming back to, say, sorry, uh, to this slide, okay, Aztec diamonds, they're not at all temporal and domains. This is something totally different if you wish the other end of the universe on it. Okay, now back to basics in the Daimler model. So what you can do, uh, you might remember it was the notion of height functions in the Daimler model. So what you can do, you can choose whatever reference configuration here in green. And not necessarily uh, even a matching of, of, your, of a given graph. So you see here it intersects, but you can take whatever reference matching of your graph and superimpose two configurations, right? Then what you see is double edges and oriented loops. So that, that's the purpose of why I oriented my blue dimers from white to, to black. Uh, other way around, anyway. And this can be viewed as a topographic map. So each time you have an, a loop, oriented loop, you say that, okay, when I cross it, I either add one or subtract one from my height function, okay? So, okay, now it becomes a height function on, on faces of my graph. What is important is that uh, though the definition of the height function itself it depends on the choice of the green configuration. The fluctuations do not. So that's... Again, here is an illustration. I mean, if you wish a map, I mean, a real map. Okay, here there are some seas, here there is a or lakes, and here there is a small mountain. So now, starting with this basic temporal and setup, what is the theorem? So now we have a random object, this height function. Fluctuations, they do not depend on the choice of the green configuration. And uh, the very first extremely beautiful theorem of, of Kenyon, already 20 years, 20 years old, is that if you assume that you just, I mean, you approximate some continuous domain, that if you assume that your graphs, they, they just approximate some given geometric shape, and they are drawn in this temporal and way, then the fluctuations converge to JFF. So what is the JFF? Uh, look at Wikipedia. This is a picture from Wikipedia. Uh, this is a process indexed by, uh, by points in a given domain. Uh, centered Gaussian covariance is the green function. It's not a random Yeah. A question, please. You say that height fluctuations do not depend on the choice of D0, you do not mean that the realizations do not depend, just that statistical quantities like variance or something like that do not depend. Is that right? Uh, no, nope. I mean that, no, nope. that once you subtract the mean, I mean that, that, that's literally the same random variable. Uh -huh. it, reference dimer configuration D0 is itself random? It, it's, it's like a deterministic shift, if you wish. No, but that's not your question. What is your question? Does it make no, sense it to? Might does it well be my question actually? So, yeah. so it's strange. No, no. It's yeah, in, in, in yeah. In, another option is to make this reference configuration random too. Uh, this is what is called double diver model when you superimpose two two, refer two random configurations. Uh, well, okay. In some respect, it is nicer. Anyway, if you are able to prove such a theorem for a single diver model, then you are able to prove this for the diver for the double diver model too, just because it's like. The same Gauss, the same covariance multiplied by square root of two. 
But what I wanted to say here is that, okay, in single dimers, I will not mention double dimers in my talk. Uh, but what I, there are other interesting questions there, uh, specifically about statistics of loops. But uh, what I wanted to mention is that, uh, okay, you can still define the height function uh, of the single dimer model, which is a random object, a priori, well, you might have worries about the choice of the reference configurations, but there is actually no importance because that's a deterministic shift. Okay? Once you subtract the mean, uh, you are done. Uh, okay, so that's the theorem. Uh, yet again, uh, let me emphasize that uh, the, uh, the very important assumption here is tempered and approximations. And the intrinsic reason for this assumption is that the proof goes through the analysis of harmonic functions, these nice boundary conditions. Okay. Now, okay, what I mentioned is that the, the fluctuations, they do not depend on the choice. But what happens is that, uh, okay, the, the, uh, the way you discretize the boundary it is important not only microscopically when you really track colors or something like that, uh, but also there is a heavy dependence on, uh, on uh, the behavior of the height function along the boundary. So here I switched to the honeycomb grid. I believe that again, you, you saw these pictures. So on the honeycomb grid, it's very easy to visualize what the height function is because that's just a stacked surface in, in, in Z3, right? And here there are two extreme cases uh, stolen from lecture notes of, of Kane. Uh, the first is a very flat thing, right? And the second is very non-flat. So how to make a link with uh, what I already spoke about is that this is okay, somewhat close to, to temporal and domains because for temporal and domains, the boundary is also flat. And this is somewhat close to that segment. Okay, and what is available, uh, what is known is that first, it is known that when you think about the surface as uh, just a surface in, in uh, in R3, this random fluctuation surface, on the scale one, it, if you rescale it by delta, okay, it concentrates to, there is a central limit here. There is a limiting profile, which is just a minimizer of a certain entropy function. And there is a prediction that the fluctuations, they should converge to the JFF, but in a metric which is non-trivial and can be constructed in a non-trivial way from this limiting surface. So this is somewhat similar to what, I, uh, to what our th theorem says, except that here the limit theorem, uh, the limit, sorry, the limit profile, uh, its very definition depends, heavily depends on the lattice. Okay, not speaking about to which extent you can prove this conjecture, I mean, this prediction. Again, the known methods, uh, they heavily relies upon discretizations upon the way how the boundary is discretized. Okay, anyway, this is very problematic beyond periodic case because you don't even know how to write, I mean, what should be a proper replacement of the entropy function. And remember my long-term motivation, my long-term motivation is just to work with irregular, irregular graphs. So I want somehow, this is what is known, that's very beautiful, but that's something that I cannot use, unfortunately. Okay, and another remark is here. Uh, so I already, I already mentioned that temporal domains, they're flat in the, in the terminology of the previous uh, slide. But this doesn't mean that uh, every flat domain, each flat domain is temporal by far. In particular, if you just start with domains composed by two by two blocks, then nobody knows how to prove that the fluctuations are goes. And it's just a striking case. The, the existing methods, they, they, they just desperately fail. Uh, what is the difference with the temporal and domains is that uh, there is no way to analyze boundary conditions for the harmonic functions. The boundary conditions, I mean, yeah, you can, you can try to, to, to write it down, but the boundary conditions are uh, 
very tricky. And this is what also answers, which is partly your question, Asaf, is that the paper you mentioned, this is about a version of this temporary bijection. So this is a deeper thing, uh, much more general, but still a version of the temporary bijection. So effectively, the paper still deals not with the height function of the Daimler model, but rather with the widened field of the, of the uniform spinning tree. And uh, to pass from, from Daimler's to uniform spinning tree in general is impossible. That, that, that's at least from my perspective. Okay, uh, now what is known about this convergence, uh, I mean, what, what is known, <laughs> another brief recap, is that, okay, Temperland, right, he, here I, I don't want to go into details, but what is known is that, con okay, the, 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 the result, the previous conjecture uh, is proven for Temperland type domains on what is called T-graphs, and uh, maybe I'll have an opportunity to mention them on the hexagonal grids and by different methods in some uh, okay either very concrete domains like that or okay in some <coughs> polygons effectively like instead of the of the hexagon here you can take a much more involved polygons but again uh, the main message is that, uh, that that's also a very very special case Cases and in particular, that's the case in study is studied in full detail. So from this respect, our paper say with Sanjay it doesn't give any new information on the convergence. The convergence to the JFF is known and the metric is known. The only information is that this metric can be understood through the Lorentz and geometry. So that's the only message. So we do know already. I mean that that's very classical, <laughs> classical uh, problem. We do know what the fluctuations are. And the only issue there is to think about, okay, how should I view this, or could I view this complex structure? Okay, so here I mentioned, that, that's already mentioned, okay, maybe just the very last comment is that uh, personally I came to the story from the easing side, and I'm not going to comment, uh, comment on the easing model uh, except on this slide. So some of you who know about this bosonization procedure, so there is something which there is a correspondence given a nearest neighbor is in model in 2D. I mean, just combinatorial. You can construct a bipartite dimer model again on 2D in, on some other graph. Uh, the correspondence of quantities is uh, not, okay, that simple as it could be. Uh, but if the general message is that if you want to analyze what is called fermionic observables here, then this is the same as to analyze Daimler's observables there. Okay, if you are interested in more subtle quantities like spins themselves, okay, that, that's, that's a boring whole story. But anyway, so in terms of embeddings, if you know how to handle bipartite diamond graphs from the from the perspectives of the perspective of the discrete complex analysis. Uh, you also know how to handle these models. That's a general message. And the paper on these model is in progress. Hopefully, appears soon. So, what we want is special embeddings of of uh, abstract weighted bipartite planar graphs and discrete complex analysis on these graphs, which would allow to reconstruct the complex structure in the limit. So that's, that's the plan. I mean, that's a big project which we, on which we are working right now. Okay, so this is just a recap. That's the, 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 the Iranian slide. That, that's the slide with the theorem. I mean, exactly the same slide. So kind of an advantage is that now, I hope I more or less explained, okay, I mentioned at least what is, what is this Gaussian free field? Okay, it is in the conformal metric of this surface. So the only thing you should know is the green function. The green function depends on the, on the conformal class. Um, okay, and now here, yeah, certainly that's a question of embeddings. Right, it should be the central object here. 
I'm going to explain, uh, now I move to explain and how it works. Okay, and again, I explain it, the idea is to explain it on exa by example. How does this work in the that's the case? So first, what you can do combinatorially in that's the case is to say, okay, here there is a vertex. And this vertex is covered either by a dimer here or by a dimer there. And this, and the weight is, the, it is one here and one there. And this is what allows actually to collapse all these white vertices to a single one macro vertex and to, to forget about black ones. So actually, just combinatorially analyzing the, the Zasta graphs is the same as analyzing graphs like here with four outer vertices. Now the embedding works actually for the dual graph, right? So what you do, okay, this graph is dual to that graph. Okay. That's just by picture. And this is, a, it's computed, it's just the perfect embedding of this, of this graph. Okay, I'm going to say what, what, what perfect means. Uh, okay, it's going to be dual graphs, and uh, before we move to definitions, uh, so here is a general picture. So first of all, these T embeddings, they appear also under the name of the, it was earlier, uh, under the name of core gauges of the bipartite dimer model. So here is the reference. In a particular case, they include both baricentric embeddings, which I already mentioned. And this is through the temporary bijection. So that's what I also mentioned. Somehow you can view, um, say, okay, each time given another way around uniform spinning trees, you can construct an appropriate dimer model, which corresponds to this uniform spinning trees. And also they generalize what is, okay, uh, named S embeddings, which is effectively just a I mean, specific case of T embeddings for, for Bayesian model. And also, I should pledge guilty because I'm one of the authors of this paper on the universality of the Eason model with Smirnov. And this is about isoidal graphs. So, isoidal graphs is a particular case of both. So, from, say, our today's perspective, this is really a boring example. I mean, that's where the structure is so nice uh, that you can do everything. Okay, so that's really, now this universality uh, now becomes a really very particular case. Okay, so what are team embeddings? Now the main definition. So team embeddings, uh, or cold gauges, uh, here is, is an illustration. So this works as follows. So first, a comment. Uh, if you work with a bipartite dimer model, the weights of edges, they do not make much sense, I mean, literally. Because if you multiply them by a factor depending only on B and another factor depending only on W, you do not change the probability measure, right? Because uh, each vertex is covered exactly once. So you just multiply all the weights by, by the product of all Gs and all the product of all Gws. So what makes sense is Called, it's called the gauge transform. And what makes sense is the weights up to these gauge equivalents. Okay. So the game is given a graph to find good gauge, a good gauge. And what we say on this picture, what we require is that first, in the, bend, the new weights are just, do you hear me? So it says my connection is unstable. Okay, the, weight, the weights are just the length of this, of this dimer, just the length of this edge. And the crucial condition is that uh, the picture, I mean, the angles are balanced at each vertex. At vertex, the sum of black is pi and the sum of white is pi. And this is a general, whatever the degrees. So if, one is able to find such a gauge, it is, it is, uh, okay. it is called Coulomb gauge, or we call it team. Okay, and uh, now there is a perfect, the notion of perfect team embeddings. And what this means 
in the prior, I mean, above, I didn't say anything, a word, on what happens at boundary vertices, right? So I just said what happens, what happens inside. And now the requirement, maybe let me go back to my whiteboard. Oh, la, la. Uh, sorry, guys. Okay, I lost my right word. Okay. Uh, well, anyway, <coughs> yeah, let me try to, to continue with this. Uh, Maybe ju just give me give me one more minute, just a second. Sure, no problem. Yeah. Well, the razor because yeah, it's, that's complicated. It's actually quite old tablet, and uh, instead of being in Zoom directly, so it is too old Android to uh, to be in Zoom directly. So it is paired with my laptop, which is useful because I can move it back and forth, uh, but. Here, the pairing is also through the, the wireless connection, and it's, it's a mess. Here I am. Thanks. I apologize. Uh, so, as I go on this picture, uh, how it looks like is the following. So, the boundary now becomes a tangential, tangential polygon in the sense, okay, I'm drawing, like, okay, something like that, okay. There's a polygon which goes okay, back and forth, like that. Okay, here the picture is, is bad. But <laughs> at every vertex, the, this edge is assumed to be just the bisector. That's the condition to be tangential. Okay. Right. So this is an assumption. Um, that's that's I, how. Yeah? Could you please repeat uh, the beginning about the embeddings? You say the black angles need to sum to pi at the interior vertices, but I didn't understand uh, this part. So uh, what is the relation of the angle to the gauge? Uh, the, there is no, I mean, there is no, that, that's a very big question, whether one can always find such an embedding or not. And here, that, that's what I plan to, to, to say next, is that there is a warning. We do not have an existence theorem right now. So for that stack, for instance, you can compute. And that's, in general, right now, we are, we are not sure that they always exist. Uh, and this is another assumption of our theorem on the convergence to the JPEG. But in particular cases, we do see that they, they exist. No, okay. but still, you, you discussed it, the gauge equivalence, which uh, right. the weights are, the model is changed by changing weights via gauge equivalence. And right. you discussed some of the black angles. Why, why did you discuss both? Is there- that, That's very important, and I'm going to comment on this on the next slide. I mean, right, right now, there's just a definition. So somehow, if you just want that the, the weights, the new weights are length, then you have a lot of flexibility. That's the point. And uh -huh. here, uh, the number of degrees, I mean, the number of degrees of freedom seems to match. Uh -huh. So, but if you just, if you just want to embed a dual graph uh, so, so that uh, there's, our, there's our lengths, uh, it doesn't fix anything. I mean, that's, that's just a very flexible construction. And you will see in a second why this condition of angles is, is important, say, for the theorem that, that, I'm, that I'm going to present. Okay. Okay. Very so, yet, yet again, here, for instance, uh, here in that's the case. What happens is that, well, okay, he, here this edge is, is a bisector. Okay, it's vertical. And now the last key definition. If not an easy one, but that's explicit. That this is an explicit answer to your question, Rob. So, because what I explained somehow is what are domains, right? 
But you remember that these domains, they should believe that it should be a graph of a surface above them, right? And from where right. this, graph, this graph comes. And this is what is called an origami map. So what is the origami map? On this picture, imagine that you fold your sheet of paper along all the drawn, all the drawn uh, edges. Okay. What I pretend is that uh, you can do this. And here is a picture that you obtain. And Mariana commands on the on the on the other thing uh, on the numbers model. Okay, but uh, here on the slide, what I pretend is that uh, you can do this, and in particular, you can do this local folding at every vertex. If you think for a second, this is exactly the angle condition, right? If you're well online, really, I, I cannot, I cannot do it. I cannot uh, provide a physical illustration. Right, but if you just take take a sheet of paper and try to fold it, then in the angle condition doesn't doesn't work. Okay, if you try to fold it like this, you see, and when you unfold, okay, here the sum of angles match. That's a general. Well, there is this folding, and this folding can be viewed as just a map from the complex plane to another complex plane. That's what we call the origami. Note that right now it acts not from R2 to R1, but from R2 to R2. Okay. I can comment on this at the very end of the talk because there's still there is something to discuss and I prefer, <laughs> prefer to discuss it first. Okay, so there are these origami maps. And then there is uh, uh, one more associated object, which is called T-graphs. And for this, I should have another illustration. <laughs> so here is the aztec of the next, I mean, of one more, one plus size. This is the embedding of this aztec, and here is the corresponding origami map. And imagine that now what I want to do, I want to consider a linear combination which is T plus O effectively. Okay, so right now alpha is zero. And what I want to do, I want to increase it a bit towards the unit circle, right? You can view it as a topological procedure if you wish. Okay, that's like a quasi-conformal mapping for people like, like, like Misha. Okay, so what happens under this procedure is that Okay, all the black faces, they collapse to segments. And this picture heavily depends on alpha. And this is an object which is called a T-graph. And again, coming back to your excellent question, Asaf, uh, this is exactly what is studied in the paper by uh, Nathanael de Benoit and Gorap. So this is, okay. The temporary bijection coming from these two graphs is exactly what, what is that would be. Okay, the message is that, okay, the, the, there are these T graphs. There is another question in the chat. Uh, right, is there a unique yeah. statement for perfect team bettings here? That's an excellent question. So first of all, they cannot be unique literally because there are Lorentz isometries of the, of the Lorentz space. Up to this, we hope they are unique, but there is no uniqueness statement. So, unique existence is, and uniqueness is a way, I mean, it's a widely open question right now. So, somehow, the, the state of the art is that we have our theorem which takes several inputs. And now the problems are on the input side. So, that's more like a very general framework for how one can do this. Okay. And now there is a notion of uh, of holomorphic functions there. So this is another illustration. So you could have started with just triangular grid instead of this picture. Then two graphs are not periodic because the origami map is not periodic. They are rather quasi periodic. Anyway, that's the color, that's the setup of, of the paper of Kenyon. Okay, what are two holomorphic functions? On T-graphs, 
there is a natural notion of harmonic functions. And you can view them as just linear along segments or affine on all the triangles. Just, that's like a surface which is built of triangles. And for such harmonic functions, you can think of about gradients. Just that there's going to be something assigned to white, to white faces here. And holomorphic functions, they are gradient of harmonics up to this multiple. What is not at all obvious at first sight, okay, it's not a big, a big deal to, to prove it, but okay, it's not at all obvious, is that this notion is independent of alpha. Because T graphs, they heavily depend on alpha. And that's just another object. But the gradients of real valued uh, harmonic functions multiplied by, by proper factor, it is intrinsic notion defined on the left picture. Okay, so far so good. And now, as I said, so we have some discrete complex analysis tools there. So that's a technical slide. I believe the most technical slide in my talk. So what are the assumptions under which we can prove regularity properties, for instance, for such functions? Uh, there is a very recent paper by Asaf, Ure, and Daniel, which uh, deals exactly with this question in the context of circle patterns. I mean, how to, to remove assumptions like bounded degree or bounded angles even. So one of the one of the usual assumptions here was just bounded angles and this stuff. Okay, so what exactly do we assume? So the origami map is always a one Lipschitz function because when you fold your plane, you do not increase distances. Now remember that we, we work with general graphs and there is no notion of the, of the lattice mesh. Okay, they can be pretty much different here and there. So delta here means the scale starts and from which the origami becomes better than one Lipschitz. Right, it is always one Lipschitz. And what we assume that starts and with some scale, it becomes strictly better which is what you should expect. Intuitively, it means that it doesn't collapse to a line. And then instead of bounded angles and uh, all that, what we assume is that there are many enough exponentially fat triangles. So, okay, we already have delta. And this exponential is a tiny number, just really something very, very small. Now we call a triangle R fat if it contains a circle of a disk of size R inside. What one could have, uh, could ask for is that all the triangles are exponentially fat, but we actually ask for less. What we say is that okay, it might be points where regions where really there is a concentration and we do not have any control. But all these regions are encircled by exponentially fat triangles. Like when you we remove all of them, then okay, the, the remaining components are small. That's regularity assumptions, and other these assumptions we are able to prove Helder regularity of, of gradients and Lipschitz regularity of harmonic functions on T-graphs. And once you have uh, the regularity theory, the question is what can be said? The natural question is what can be said uh, on subsequent limits. And you can prove that uh, the, the subsequential limits, they are martingales with respect to certain diffusion. But this diffusion depends on what is the graph of the origami map. It's not like always the Brownian motion. That, that's, a very, <coughs> that's a very, very important message is that somehow you might be so addicted to the Brownian motion that to say that a random walk on these on this graphs always converges to the Brownian motion. This is just simply false. That's the point. If the origami map is small, then this is correct, like it was on the triangular grid. But in general, the metric of the surface comes into play. And the quite long story short is that under the assumption that the horizontal surface 
is Lorentz minimal, what you can prove is that the limits of harmonic functions, they're harmonic, but in the metric of this new surface. So at this point, this is when, when you already identified what, I mean, uh, what are the closed forms in the limit. So that's a matter of computations. And what happens is that, okay, they're harmonic in, uh, in, this, in this new parameterization. So uh, what you use is that this parameterization is both conformal and harmonic, which is exactly the condition for the surface to be minimal. And moreover, so do not only harmonic functions on T-graphs, but also Daimler height functions, uh, correlations, sorry, correlations. Of the functions. So that's how this Lorentz geometry comes into play into, into the game in our approach. So what we do, we say, okay, in general, there is this dependence on both the, the, the surface and alpha. And when, in which situation can we say that the limits are harmonic just in some new variable? And then this conditional naturally appears. So okay, it's, it's in a sense both ways. Okay, so now that's a recap of the theorem, I'm almost done. So that's the next slide is just open questions and some perspectives. So yet again, let me emphasize that this is an assumption, right? We assume that the graphs are perfectly embedded. Uh, yes, that, that, that's, that's, a, that's a correct, yes. Yes. Uh, they're still called minimal uh, because of some reason. Maximal surfaces, there is a notion of maximal minimal surfaces, which, which is the, okay, the biggest under inclusion. The, so here is the assumption. Uh, we assume that these embeddings are already found. And here is another weird assumption, is that the graphs of the origami map, they converge to the Lorentz metric. And let me repeat that, if I started just with these assumptions, this would be totally crazy, right? But there is this postcard which says, but look, this happens. Uh, okay, but provided the, the, this, this is done, then, then uh, what we can do, we can uh, prove that fluctuations converge to the Gaussian free field. And notice that we do not use any assumption on the combinatorics of this graph along the boundary. So there is nothing like, okay, it was temporary on domain or two by two blocks or whatever. So the question, the difficulty is now here, is to prove that there exists perfect embeddings. And as I said, okay, that, that's a big question. Uh, okay, this is just an, an illustration of, of an embedding of a slightly bigger sign, a uh, bigger aesthetic diamond. Uh, what is a good point in our analysis, at, at least what I feel to be a strong point, is that we do not require uh, bounded angles yet again. So what we require instead is this exponential fat, which is still something. In particular, we are unable to, to completely remove everything as a software and Daniel did. But at least this is already plausible, I mean, in, in some interesting contexts. That, okay, it could be concentrations. Intuitively, it says that it could be some heavy concentration at the point, but we forbid like very bad lines. So it shouldn't be like, like a very bad behavior along curves. So it sounds to be, at least for me, so so in the context in the original from the original motivation perspective to understand what happens with, uh, with random graphs. Okay, now just open questions and perspectives. And uh, the, the, the very big question is this existence and uniqueness. So uh, this is definitely something that should be should be understood. It is known in when the outer degree is four. 
the number of degrees of freedom match. When you start analyzing hexagons, uh, in concrete cases, you see that, that there's embeddings exist. There are interesting phenomena like breaking symmetry and so on and so forth, but that sounds like a terra incognita. Now, to understand why they do this. Another question is, okay, that's a crazy story. Why at all this Lorentz geometry appears? And it should be an intrinsic reason. And of course, most probably all that should be related to each other. I mean, okay, it, it would be extremely weird coincidence. I mean, yeah, all that would be extremely weird coincidence if these questions are not related to each other. And uh, what I want to say is that there is another example uh, uh, that one can easily compute is when you start with an analog graph, like imagine a cylinder, right? And you view the interior face as just a face of huge degree. So that's, you view this graph as a, as a graph having the topology of the disk. And you can compute what is the perfect embedding in this case, and here is the picture. And you can compute, that's a simple computation, what is the, the graph of the origami map. And it turns out to be this Lorentz minimal cusp. So again, you check, that's just an experiment you, you, uh, you perform. You start it with a graph, for which you can compute the perfect embedding, and then miraculously you see that, that okay, the, the, the graph is close to the Lorentz surface. Okay, what I somehow skipped is that, remember that the origami map is R2 to R2, and all these picture, both pictures are in R3. Uh, the reason is that the first coordinate uh, vanishes in the limit, so somehow it degenerates. And the reason for minimal surfaces, so, so th this example is of a different type, uh, because of the huge, huge degree here. But for minimal surfaces, the reason is that, uh, well, okay, here, that's when you lift the origami on the, at the boundary to here, when uh, it just becomes uh, the, the first coordinate vanishes tautologically. That's the point. And because we are interested in minimal surfaces, okay, if, if the boundary is actually three dimensional, then the whole surface should be should be in three dimensions. Okay, there and uh, basically that's it. Except that here, that there is now some development, and it was motivated by something very concrete. And it seems that we are still. Uh, okay, thanks for the reference. It's really welcome. And uh, yep. Uh, except that, uh, okay. what happens with random maps is, um, is of course still totally unclear. But it sounds that it now, it's worth to develop like a new concept, is that all these embeddings, they, they should, should be equipped with surfaces over them. So that's what I believe is a correct perspective. And uh, uh, yep, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, questions to Bima, please. Right. Me well this time. Yes, we hear you better, sir. Okay, great. Uh, I, I guess it was first thing that I was wondering that you probably mentioned. What what examples can you analyze using your theorem? Except for yeah, that, that, that's, I, I would say very few. I would say very few at this point. So that's, uh, for, for me, that's, uh, so frankly, even in that's the case, we do not have a proof, I mean, we do not check this assumption ex fact. So it is, not, it is not even a new proof in that's the case. So yeah, the, the um, yeah, I believe that's, that's a fair answer, is that we, we do not have, we do not have uh, many examples. Uh, right. So some, somehow here. Yeah. Right. I can say more. <laughs> but what, what, what I'm, what I'm, so already a hexagon, for instance, this hexagon with Los Angeles, uh, it is not done yet. So I believe, I believe that that's a very good direction. I mean, just to play with, uh, with other concrete graphs and to understand with. So, so somehow here, okay, this is a lazy walk. I mean, that, that's, 
This is, is really simple. Uh, it's it's not done, but in the cylinder, in the regular cylinder case, uh, I feel it's it's really not, not hard to prove convergence. But uh, except the fluctuations of, of the of the height of the huge phase. But here, this time, that there are no trivial examples. Otherwise, the theorem would be like a crap, All right? But we do have a reference in the chat, and yeah, may, maybe people also people also knew this before. I, I don't see the reference. Was it sent to everyone in the chat? Yeah. No, it it was. It was. Uh, okay. I hope. Uh, yeah, no, it it was sent privately. Uh, I don't know for which reason. Okay. I got the permission to share. Uh, uh, to everyone. No, that's a crazy chat. Why cannot I copy past right there? Okay, here is the reference. Okay, thank you. Uh, other questions, please? Uh, yes, I have another one, <laughs> if that's okay. Sure. Go, go ahead. Yeah. Examples for perfect T embeddings in which the origami map does not converge to a minimal surface? Excellent. Uh, well, as I said, we do not have uh, many examples of, uh, of perfect embeddings. Uh, but one can do like the reverse engineering, right? That, that's just a question whether I'm able to draw a graph because the, this question, it doesn't know anything about, about Denver model, right? Uh, yeah. So if, if I just draw my graph and construct this, uh, this surface, then what is exactly the mechanism um, of appearance of, I mean, what, what exactly can I obtain as a, uh, at the end of the day? In a sense, now, so, so I, my opinion on this fluctuates. Now I believe it is not always uh, the minimal surface. I mean, the, even now I even believe that one maybe can cook up an example in Dangerous. Uh, and then uh, the question arises, how should one modify our theorem? So what are exactly the correlations? So what I believe everybody, everybody would agree with is that correlations should be Gaussian process. The fact that the covariance should be just the green function and not something more complicated that there should exist a conformal structure in, in where it is the green function, it is less, it is less uh, trivial. So then this here, that, that's an excellent question. Okay, thank you. Um, and this comes back to this slide, right? Because essentially we can analyze, um, okay, we, I would say we do have information about correlations. I mean, what, uh, what equation they, they, they satisfy, if you wish. Not a question, but okay, how, like, we do have some information. The, the only problem is that this equation is not the harmonicity anymore. And yeah, something like that. Uh, other questions, please. Um, I, I had a question, uh, sorry. Um, be a bit more basic. Um, go, go, go so, um, <laughs> so you you want to embed the model so that the dimer model height function uh, converges to a GFF. That seems the most reasonable. Uh, and uh, this embeddings uh, that you find the T embeddings and uh, even in other uh, more uh, simple cases of domains where the embeddings were known before, uh, are they specialized to the dimer model? If in of the dimer model, it was uh, the um, Lupo N model with the different. Yes, in, yes, it, it's extremely special. The reason is that, no, no, but the conceptual reason for that is that, okay, why uh, are you able to analyze discrete harmonic functions? Because there is the discrete Laplace, right? So the natural objects like the green function, uh, they're just entries of the inverse Laplace, 
of some metrics. And the local relation is just the manifestation of the fact that delta minus one to delta by delta is one, is identity. Yes. Right? Yes. The Daimler model is determinantal. Mm -hmm. Right? The partition function is known to be okay, five yes. or determinant in the bipartite case of sums. You just say, okay, conceptually, let me take the let me consider the entries of the inverse. And those are quantities that satisfy local which satisfy local relations, right? Mm -hmm. Just because of the very same argument. Uh, you are explaining why the Daimler model has a, a way of analysis via right. Angle. But uh, what I'm asking is whether other models would necessarily require other embeddings, which are specialized, oh. in, say percolation or loop uh, or something or FK model or uh, I don't. Well, as far as I understand, the common belief is that uh, in reasonable setups, all these embeddings are close to, to each other, um, right? So it's possible that one embedding works for many models. No, but the question, and no, that, that's what I said. How at all would you do this analysis? No, so, no, not the analysis. The question is about whether it is correct. For oh, instance, the circle path. Yeah, for, for, me, for me, that's a plausible perspective. Yeah, so, so somehow, well, let, let me just say, let, let me just say it concretely, say, the question whether I believe uh, that uh, if I embed by circle packings in some way, I don't know, circle patterns maybe records in the weights, then what I have is a complex structure close to to that one. Well, I don't know. It it's, it could be it could be easily the case. I don't uh -huh. know. I, I don't know at this point. So here somehow peculiarity appears because what we embed, I mean, the, we do not embed into the plane. Right? I mean, the complex structure is not given by that of the embedding itself. Right. So that's a peculiarity. Uh, but in general, right, we, we just believe that there is one complex structure in discrete, right? The, the, the graphs, they, they just used to carry some, some complex structure. That's, that's, I believe, a perspective taught us, to us by Z, right? It's somehow that there is, that, that, that there is like, um, so, uh, and then uh, what, what can you say then about the circle packing embedding? Uh, is that a good embedding uh, also, or is that uh, sometimes not the right, not a good embedding? Well, the, 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 the question again, uh, good for what? No, it's, 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 it's definitely a good thing. I mean, okay, ask Asaf. <laughs> 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 it doesn't, it's not quite clear that it's relevant for the Daimler model. Right, right. So, so the point is that I have absolutely no clue how to analyze Daimler observables there. So that's... Circle packing also seems to be irrelevant for critical percolation, for example, as uh, Oded already knew. So, so again, there is this thing that different models may require different packings or different embeddings. Right, right. But, but, but that's also a commonly accepted idea, I believe, that you should use... Uh, well, I learned it myself from Stas many years ago, like definitely more than 10, is that one should use observables of the model, of a given model to embed this model, right? Compare, for instance, with uh, what uh, the colleagues call card embeddings, right? I would have called them Carlison, but any, anyway. <laughs> Uh, when they use percolation observables to just 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 to embed percolation, and here that's exactly the same. So in a sense, that was uh, that was an answer by Mariana. So somehow these perfect embeddings they they appear as um, okay. One can view them as uh, just dynamic observables themselves. Mm -hmm. The story of the Eason model, which is somewhat parallel and which start at exactly the same time as S embeddings. Uh, that, that's, that's, that's the very same idea. You, you start with, with these observables defined on an abstract graph to construct this S embedding. And then you do analysis on this embedding. So the perspective is like that. I see. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions? Okay, I, I actually still have some questions, but uh, maybe we'll um, we'll end uh, the recording. Um.
now and uh, then continue a bit uh, kind of uh, less formally those who want to stay and ask questions uh, are very welcome to stay. Uh, so uh, let us have a last uh, round of uh, applause or virtual applause. Uh, you can unmute yourself and have an actual applause uh, for an excellent talk. Yeah, thanks again for, for the opportunity. Okay, so uh, I'll end the recording. Uh,